All right, we finish our AFC South preview, Brian, by looking at the Tennessee Titans and uh, down in Nashville, something of a lost year. Obviously, a new era now begins with uh, Brian Callahan in town. We talked about Shane Steichen and the impacts that he's made on the Colts, and he came as advertised. Brian Callahan is kind of the guy that everybody expects to do that this year. He hung around the next year in Cincinnati after taking them to one Super Bowl as OC, hoping that he could be part of another run. Joe Burrow injury meant that that didn't happen, but he won a lot of plaudits last year for um, the, the Bengals consistently hanging in there in, in the toughest division in the NFL and not being too far off it in the end, despite having to do it for most of the year with their backup quarterback. He earns a shot now to try and transform Will Levis into uh, into something, someone that can that can do it in the NFL. We saw a sensational debut from from Levis, but I wonder if we if we start there with him and they've, they've made some interesting free agency. Uh, signings as well and there's a couple of note in there including Tony Pollard but maybe let's start with Levis because to me he's one of those guys that because he looks the part you know I think of Moneyball and the the baseball scouts talking about the guy who had the body and the guy who had the arm and they overlook all the inherent flaws and how they actually play the game because their their biases predispose them to looking at a guy who just quote-unquote looks the part of a quarterback which Levis unquestionably does fired a couple of amazing shots downfield in his first game finished with I think with three touchdown passes sensational debut when a guy can launch a ball like that people will forgive him a lot it never really happened again no, if Colin was here back in the day, he would have said, I'm sure he was only throwing bombs up in the air. They weren't, he was, didn't see them as precision passes. It was more that he exposed the poor this Falcon where, secondary. Uh, where, yeah. where Colin would come in with the, he launches the Megatron be down there somewhere shot. Yeah, exactly. But what I would say is, in fairness, um, I think he was up against it for a large part of the season in terms of the team was struggling. It's very difficult for a rookie quarterback to go into a team and things are signaling in the, in the, in the wrong direction. You're expecting him to come in and have a really fruitful and productive start. But I would say to suggest that there is a positive outcome for this in terms of him potentially being the, the answer for the Titans is how well he played in Miami in a really tough environment when they were given no chance whatsoever on the Monday night football. And I know it's towards the back end of the season when we're seeing these results. Like the Dolphins at the time were, were going for number one seed and people will say, okay, this is the Dolphins. We know that the 10th show away these Game, but they were up by 14 points and it looked like a meaningless game, which five or six minutes ago. And he rallied them t- that team. And there was also a moment in the game earlier on where he had this powerful run. And it just looked to me like a, a kind of guy that said, I am capable of putting this team on my back. And I am capable of being the, the quarterback in which this team believes. And the owners certainly believe. It. I mean, this season, you're talking about teams who have a convincing owner. Like these owners come out and the way the owners talk about this quarterback is if he's the, the finished article. And people are kind of saying, Are you looking at the same quarterback in which we saw last year? I think. By and large, I, I think there's a, enough there for me to kind of see that he could potentially be the quarterback in the future. For and I do like them. I think they're a sneaky dark horse this year. I think people are writing them off. I think this, we're talking about a division that last year where two teams essentially came out of nowhere in the Colts and, and the Texans with new head coach. So I think this is a, I have that feeling for this team. You look at what they've done. Like Pollard's a nice running back. I know he's had some injury concerns and the Cowboys supposed didn't get the answer in which they wanted him. Was he the bell cow running back that they desired? But I think there is other players in there in the running back room that can help Pollard because they had some nice additions last year. There was a rookie running back that had a really strong season in, in Spiller. And then you've got some nice additions. Chris Boyd coming in from the Bengals, nice addition. Obviously, he, he's worked with the head coach. You've got Ridley. I think the fact that they've taken Ridley Tyler, out of Tyler the... Boyd. Tyler Boyd, sorry. And you've got Ridley, who essentially left the Jags and he's gone to a team and can and make better in the division. And he's a really fruitful... DeAndre Hopkins had a nice year last year. I think there's enough, and I think the division allows for a team to quickly strike back. And I think the Titans are a team that potentially could strike back. I think they haven't lost enough, an awful lot in defense. I think I still think there's good players there, such as Simmons, that they could have a, a bounce back year. Not necessarily saying they're going to win the division, but I think they'll certainly put themselves back in the mix. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. Some people are suggesting this team are picking in the top five next year. I'm not, I'm not buying that. I think there's a, a good chance on their new head coach and enough of an upward trajectory for the quarterback to, to turn this around. How do you see the trajectory, Kieran? Because the Titans strike me as one of those teams with a lot of players that you can name, but not necessarily a huge amount that you're going, yeah, he's an actual difference maker, including Calvin Ridley. I'm not entirely sure about whether he's worth the money they're shelling out for. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. I think with this division, it's almost, uh, you know, it's, it's it's two halves, really. You got the, the, upper, the upper tier, and then you got the Colts and the Texans who are going to be scrambling for, for last place. I mean, Titans, I'm sorry. Um, Huge, huge offseason in, in, in Nashville. I mean, getting rid of 
you know, getting rid of Vrabel, nobody saw that. I mean, uh, I know it was a bad season, but uh, an absolute alpha male like Vrabel it can't even, you know, get a head coach job. I mean, that's still a messy uh, – there's, there's still a fallout from that messy kind of uh, uh, thing with him and Ron, and Rand Carthen. Um, so now they're trying to change that kind of identity. And with Callahan coming in, they're looking at a softer, more – I don't know, a more kind of offensive uh, kind of approach uh, to, to the team. I just, again, I don't see as much talent on the team as as, as, as some of the other teams. Um, they had a nice draft with, with J.C. Latham. And, um, and Karen, to, to your point, and so, sorry to cut across you, yeah. but like when, when you mentioned that the, the Ron Carter and um, Vrabel rift and, and you know, the, the, the fallout from the A.J. Brown trade in particular, like you let go of a guy like that they're very, very, very difficult to replace. And, you know, Tyler Boyd, Calvin Ridley, still to me, don't make up for one A.J. Brown. Like, you have a guy like that, you do whatever it takes to hold on to him. Like, that was the big lesson to me from that whole thing. Yeah. And and again, we're, you know, it's discussed and it, it's been discussed before. This is not uh, this is not 2019 or 2020. You know, you're getting Calvin Ridley, who's, you know, he's no spring chicken, neither is, Dion, n- neither is D-Hop. Um, and Pollard, we've seen how running backs fall off a cliff I mean, we saw with Zeke Elliott at Dallas, where where Pollard was, uh, not a great season last year. Who's to say he's going to, you know, find that uh, find that form again? Again, similar to the Colts, I just don't see enough talent on the on the on, on the offensive side of the ball. Defense, they they, they seem okay. I, I don't have much kind of, uh, you know, they got Joseph uh, Sebastian Joseph Day, um, Jamal Adams back there in the secondary. Um, deep defense should keep them in games. I just don't see enough, you know, on the offensive uh, side of the ball talent wise. I think it's. Uh, some of those guys just have too much miles on the clock and it's it's yeah they got Tyler Boyd in Legere Sneed was a huge pickup on the defense I forgot to mention him but um I just think between them and the Colts it's it's going to be you know it's going to be a, a race to the bottom really I think I would give more kind of credence to the Titans having a better season than the Colts it's they're not going to want to call it a rebuilding year in, in Nashville but it, it all it, it to all intents and purposes it really is I mean you got Will Levis who only threw eight touchdowns and four interceptions, but barely, I think he had barely 1,800 yards last year in, in nine, nine or 10 games. I just, you know, he may come, he may come good. And like you mentioned earlier, you know, they want to have Josh Allen Mark too, but I, uh, nobody's Josh Allen Mark too. Um, I think he'll be serviceable. Um, but, uh, you know, you got, you have Mason Rudolph on the bench talking about other backup quarterbacks. You know, we, you know, we saw what they did with Pittsburgh when they were in trouble, they put Rudolph in there. So, it may get to the stage by week seven, week eight, with if the offense is struggling and and those those passes are not being caught, and there's you know similar to Devonte Adams, his helmet's being smashed on the sideline. Are they going to go to Rudolph, switch it up a little bit because it's going to be a tough second year for Levis? He didn't, and yeah, he, came, he you know he caught fire when he started in the league, but he leveled off real quick. Um, there's questions about the accuracy. You know, he is a prototypical good-looking quarterback. Doesn't always translate, so it's going to be a real big year for him too. Keep an eye on Mason Rudolph coming in from from the sidelines around uh, early November. Shane, you kind of laid your cards on the table in this division a little bit earlier by tipping the Colts as your surprise potential division champion. So I take it that means you're not as high on the Titans. I'm not as high on the Titans, and I have and I've lost complete faith in the Titans as an organization the moment that they got rid of Mike Vrabel. It wasn't even the decision. It was the nature of the decision and the reasons that the ownership gave as to why they got rid of him. I'll just read the quote here from uh, the owner, Amy Adams Strunk, is that they, uh, the teams who are get, get best sustained, sustained success are those who empower an aligned and collaborative team across all football functions. That is international advisory firm speak for he didn't do what I wanted and he was sniffing around with the Patriots too much this year that I told him to go and shag off up the I-95 to Massachusetts and I don't want to deal with him anymore. Give me a head coach that I can control and give me a quarterback which is cheap so I can spend my money lobbying for a brand new stadium in the middle of Nashville. That's all that's about. And when, and, when, and when that's the organization that you're coming into, I, I, we can talk as much about Will Levis and uh, to his potential at working with Brian Callahan, who, again, I think, is, uh, I think is using this position as a stepping stone to work in an organization which, where he might actually find some success in two, three, four years' time. You know, for Brian Callahan, the aim here, here is to, to show that with the offensive pieces he has, that the offense looks better than it did at, at the end of the season than it did at the start of the season. That's as far as you're going to get in an organization like this where it's very much top down, where football organization, or where football decisions and football uh, operations probably aren't being, uh, the decisions around that 
probably aren't being made by football people. They're being made by ownership. They're being made by business people. They're being made, made by people who want to try and make the franchise into something which isn't necessarily focused on winning the Super Bowl. It's focused on uh, solidifying other elements of their of their uh, organization. And that's fair enough. Look, if that's, if that's the way that the ownership want to go about it, Fine. They want to get rid of Mike Vrabel, one of the one of the, the top head coaches, somebody they had in situ, somebody who knows the uh, the organization and the culture. Fair enough. They didn't have a strong uh, Shane, season. I, I find the billionaires but... don't get an awful lot of love on this show. Like you, you try being that wealthy <laughs> and having all those people hanging out of you. Like it, being an owner isn't as easy as you make it sound. Well, they they can cry me a Dubai River. Uh, I'm not I'm not too too worried about that. Well, what I am what I am worried about though is is like two things. You know, we talk about Brian Hallen. I think he's somebody who has the potential to show himself in a good light, depending on on, on how we sort of act as quarterback whisperer to Will Levis. The problem is, I'm I'm just not quite sure how how good Will Levis is. You mentioned there the fact that he looks the part. It doesn't mean he's actually going to do anything. I don't. As he, I think he's only played one game where he's passed for over 300 yards. His pass completion rate is not good. His decision making is not good. And fair enough. You know, the team he has now. The names that are around him, maybe not the talent, maybe not the system, but the names around him are more recognizable, and they might be able to find some way to to get things on the ground. But I think, look, it's there's the handbrake is on with with the Titans organization this year, and and probably will be now for the next couple of seasons. If you're going to get rid of Mike Vrabel like that and basically say, look, I don't like the fact that you're not agreeing with the decisions I'm making, give us this cheap quarterback. And as Brian alluded to earlier, the fact that the organization is saying, look, Will Levis is the, is, is the next big thing. He's the next cheap thing so they can save their money and, and spend it elsewhere. That's all that's about. And look, it's, it, and I, I, don't, I don't take take any joy in saying that. But that, that unfortunately, that is the lens in which we have to judge all of the coaching staff in particular, that that is what they're working with in, in this organization. So for that reason, I don't think that the Titans are going to make the playoffs. I think they're, they're going to be in the basin and in fourth place in the division. Are they going to be the worst team in football? I think there's a couple of other um, other teams who will probably be picking the top three next year, but certainly a top six or seven pick for, for the Titans uh, next season. I just don't expect them to be good enough to really make a run at it at all. Connor, can I make a quick point? Uh, Raven's a fantastic head coach in his own right. Like they were number one seed a couple of years ago. Um, but let's bear in mind there was John Robinson that traded AJ Brown away and he fell out with him. And I'm not saying he fell out with, with Ron Carson either, but certainly you've had him. I wouldn't say he they wrecked, they felt he was having a bigger influence than they wanted in the organization. And maybe we kind of touched on that in a roundabout way, but I think that's might be the feeling that you know, if you want to have an influence in this organization, you can't be off doing other city teams in your bye week, such as sitting beside. Uh, Mr. Kraft, I think well, it is right to feel a bit, you know, a bit disingenuous to have your head coach sitting at whatever party that the pages are holding one weekend. It's, just, it's not a good look. It's not a good look for a head coach to be doing that. You certainly wouldn't think. Do you not think, though, Brian? So one of two things has happened here because obviously Bill Belichick now is spending more of his time with Pat McAfee than, than anything else. Um, he seems yeah, to be Vrabel having thought he was life. walking into the job. That's he, what you're talking he didn't about. get a job. Vrabel didn't get a job either. Like either the tide has gone out on the alpha. GM slash head coach prototype that, that Bill Belichick carved out in New England, or owners have made two terrible decisions here and leaving two extremely capable head coaches sit and kicking their heels and they're going to get paid next year. But but on that with Vrabel, I understand the, the point that he probably shouldn't have gone up to uh, on the bye week to go up and accept that he was brought into the Patriots Hall of Fame. That's an off-season thing to do, and I, I, I get that point. You're, you're, you're right on that, Brian. But don't sack Vrabel before he gets he gets a chance to, to try and the to be not offered the Patriots job, which you end up not doing anything. Let him be in situ, and if he and if he's not given it, let him use that as 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 a form of hunger to try and prove the league wrong, because he's established himself. He's proved himself to be uh, a, a wily and intelligent head coach. Some some owner is going to pick him up next season, and I think uh, and Vrabel is going to prove himself to be uh, to be a good operator. It's quite clear that something inside the organization just wasn't working well. Is is that all the organization's fault? Probably not. But I still think it was it's just a bad decision and the way it was done and how quickly it was done at the end of the season. And I guess the the fact that it was actually slightly unexpected based on what I heard from uh, people in national media. It's just, it just seems like that it was something something kind of got ratty in, in in a way which probably doesn't bode well for the next person who's sitting in that seat. That's that's my view on it anyway. Don't forget, don't forget the Vrabel's still sniffing around. He's over with the, with Cleveland, you know, him and Jim Schwartz together. Yeah. That's dastardly muddly right there. They're, they're, they're going to be up to something. 
Yeah, we never quite got round to my off-season suggestion of ranking which head coaches would be most likely to win a scrap. But I'd have Rabel in the top five there, <laughs> alongside Dan Campbell and D'Amico Ryan's. Like they're 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 my favourites now to emerge from the head coaching battle royale. If it was uh, mano a mano, knuckles on knuckles. Uh, that is our AFC South preview, though, for the Irish NFL show. Make sure and check out all our other uh, divisional previews wherever you get your podcasts. Do please remember to like and subscribe.